My name is John Steichen. I uh, came or grew up in a family farm in Ulan, which is in northwest Minnesota. Out of college, I moved to western Montana for three years, and then central Ohio for 17 years, and 15 years in central Indiana, and five years in the northern part of the mitt of Michigan prior to moving to uh, Panama in October of 2020. Uh, my wife and I moved to Panama for a number of reasons. Um, main reason, uh, you know, studying weather cycles over the past thousand, two thousand years, uh, we could see that the northern hemisphere would be entering into a cooling season or a cooling period. So we wanted to uh, live in an area that we could grow food year-round as well have uh, plenty of uh, water and uh, availability to grow a garden. What we like about Volcan is its uh, farming community. Um, most of the vegetables and dairy, up to 80%, uh, come from this region. You know, Volcan, just a little bit north, uh, Paso Ancho and Cerro Punta, uh, they provide, well, they're the breadbasket of Panama. So the, so it provides excellent growing opportunities here. And in addition, uh, the expat community is very diverse. Um, there are a number of uh, South Africans, Germans, Canadians, Australians, and other people from country in addition to Americans that, uh, that live here. And good group, good community, uh, supporting each other. In addition uh, to the, the temperate climate of Volcan is very attractive. This is a highland area, about 4,500 feet. Doesn't get too hot doesn't get too cold. You don't have AC systems or heating systems in your home, which is uh, pretty nice. We came from a climate of snow and ice, uh, six, seven months of winter. So it's a, it's a wonderful change uh, to live here. Probably the, the main dislike of Panama is uh, government red tape and inefficiencies. Um, example being, we bought a car from a couple in Boquete back in 2022, and this couple was moving to Mexico. The car was registered, titled in uh, Panama City, which is on the eastern end of the country, and we wanted to transfer title to the area where we decided to live in Volcan. It was a six-month process with numerous trips uh, to government agencies and inspections and so on. And I, it got to be a little you know, testing of patience. But uh, I can kind of see, too, that the government provides a lot of jobs for the, for the communities, for the country. And these jobs are important to people. So oh, that's uh, that's why they uh, that's why they exist. Even though it may be inefficient, you uh, you learn to adjust and, and deal with it. Our experience growing food here is uh, mainly positive. Um, there is a learning curve, however. There are two essentially dry two essential seasons here. Uh, it's a dry season and a wet season. The dry season is typically, uh, you know, end of November, end of April, and wet season typically maybe beginning of May, beginning of November. And uh, some uh, garden plants do very well in dry season, but not in wet season. But then some plants do very well in dry and wet season. Um, so it's a, 
you just have to learn. You have to kind of do some experimentation, talking to other people, other gardeners, knowing what um, uh, natural sprays you can put on them. We don't use any of the chemical sprays. We strictly organic. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a challenge, and even uh, even the bugs and the birds and the stray dogs and they can all make a mess of things. Uh, example being leaf cutter ants. If there are any hills around, now they can come in at night and clear a, a row of vegetables. In the morning you come, everything's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't even see an ant they're they're they're, they're quick so uh, yeah those those are the challenges uh, but overall uh, soil here is rich volcanic and uh, it supports uh, growing very good we have a number of variety of foods planted here mainly native varieties um, but also a few varieties of North American plants that have brought in uh, seeds, heirlooms we, we try to do the most of. But uh, kind of behind me here is a sweet potato patch. And uh, we have uh, three varieties, three main varieties of sweet potatoes we grow. A purple variety, uh, a yellow variety, and an orange variety. And sweet potatoes do very well during dry and wet season both, as long as they have good uh, drainage. But then there's also native plants like otoy and yucca. They're a, they're a root plant that you grow similar to like a potato. And uh, they have natural defenses against uh, diseases and insects. Uh, so they do very good, um, but we also have a, a row of peanuts we're growing for the first time. Excuse me, lettuce, um, three varieties of peppers, hot, <laughs> very hot and mild. Uh, beets, carrots, cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, broccoli, corn. Um, bush bean. I have a good variety of bush bean that uh, does very well. Plus we have also have a pineapple patch that we started. Uh, pineapples take about 18 to 24 months to, to get a final pineapple. But last week we, uh, we planted uh, some fruit trees. Um, Oranges, plum, and let's see, pear, and then we also have an avocado, and some native uh, fruits like maracuja, uh, marañón, and, uh, and actually I'm uh, going to plant some coffee here within the next week once the coffee plants have uh, have climatized. The most successful um, garden plants have definitely been the sweet potatoes. They're very hardy. And our squash, we have a squash patch. They do well during the dry season. You have to kind of watch them closely during wet season with any fungus, but they, they grow very well. Otoy and yucca, um, they're native they have high resistance and uh, I mentioned that uh, bush bean uh, provider bush bean provider you can get back in the states and it's uh, it's done very well here the first garden we planted uh, I planted five varieties of uh, just beans three died right off I don't know might have been the, the UV Sun or the fourth variety did average, but the provider did very well, and I and I actually need to pick some today. <laughs> they've uh, 
they provide all of our you know beans for us that we can or blanch and uh, very very few disease problems and uh, no insect problems except the ants at times um, the least successful have been the tomatoes you're talking like the beefsteak type during wet season yeah uh, wet season definitely is a great um, you know for funguses it just uh, they're hard to, to battle and once uh, tomato gets kind of like that uh, leaf wilt you know it's gone um, so I try to do the tomatoes during dry season cucumbers the same way during wet season they struggle with diseases too even even if you you know, spray them regularly with uh, natural, they, uh, they still struggle. The foods that we like the best, taste the best, um, are the sweet potatoes. Like the three varieties we grow, the purple variety is a real high in antioxidants, very healthy sweet potato. The yellow variety is a really good producer, probably produces twice, you know, poundage wise as the other two varieties. And uh, we use those for baking. The orange sweet potato is very sweet and uh, kind of more of a delicacy almost. It, uh, it, we, we really enjoy those. And we like, uh, the green beans, um, like the provider, the provider bush green bean is a is a wonderful addition, and cherry tomatoes. We really love the cherry tomatoes. Very sweet and uh, just a delight. Here we have a papaya tree. It's about two years old, maybe a little less. Fruit developing. Flower up on top. This whole area behind was jungle. It was about 20 years of growth and uh, we cut down, pulled up trunks, pulled up roots and within the jungle there were numerous lemon trees that had been established and uh, this is one of the lemon trees surviving. On the fence line here is a plant called chayote and this is the fruit it produces it can be chopped up and put in a salad raw it can be baked it can be sliced up and pickled so there's many uses and it's very easy to grow in Panama mostly of a vine that goes all the way up the fence and down and very prolific provider here you see a pineapple inside of a cage. This is just chicken netting that has been wrapped around a five gallon bucket and formed into a, a cage. This one is not quite ready for a cage, but it will probably within the next uh, number of weeks will be. And that is used to prevent possum from, uh, from eating. Yeah, they, uh, Possums have a pretty good nose. They'll they know when a pineapple is about ripe, and they will they will find a way to eat it if you don't cage it up. Yeah, we were inside a bamboo greenhouse. A uh, greenhouse here is is like a big umbrella. It's it protects plants for the from the heavy rains. But over here, you'll see a large mass of cherry tomatoes that are producing very well. And I've been experimenting here with varieties of corn with uh, green beans growing amongst the corn. I've got some cucumbers that are, are pretty well done. Right in front here, there's some peppers, some mild peppers, some hot peppers. The leaf cutter ants love strawberries. So I made a PVC pipe and a frame to kind of keep, keep the strawberries off the ground. One night, the leaf cutter ants 
totally stripped the strawberries. Everything was gone. And uh, <laughs> so uh, they're coming back good. And I've been and I've been uh, treating them so that it keeps the ants away. We've actually moved this away so the ants wouldn't get them. Have a good good growth of beans. These are the provider beans that I had mentioned. And I'm getting ready to pick these. This is the very first first picking here. And uh, they've done very well. They consistently do well. Beets. Carrots. In these smaller hooped structures, we have a row of broccoli that's just starting to just starting now to develop a, a crown. We have a row of uh, climbing sweet snap peas. They'll be crawling up or lining up on this trellis here. We have some lettuce. We have some more flowers. Uh, on the far end is nasturtium. Have some more peppers, basil, thyme, sage. Here's some uh, first time planting some uh, Chinese icicle radish. At the far end is some chives and also uh, another form of uh, Chinese uh, lettuce. As well as uh, the first row here is peanuts. First time growing peanuts. I was going to mention these, uh, these hoop structures have done very well here. They're simple pallets with PVC and plastic over top. We do get some strong winds during the dry season. And the small hoops actually, you know, they take the wind pretty good. There's enough give to them that when the wind hits them, they don't break. They kind of give with the wind. And then the wind over top of the main greenhouse. Back in February this year, we had some real strong winds that took down many trees in the surrounding area. The hoop structures survived fine, which was, a, I guess, a good testament to their uh, construction. And uh, surprisingly, they, they made it through. Uh, during dry season, uh, it can be a real challenge to keeping your garden properly watered. Um, there can be a stretch of uh, four months where there's absolutely no rain. And it's pretty warm and the sun's intense. The mountains do provide uh, streams. And so there's a number of springs in the area here that keep the small streams fed. And we're fortunate enough to have a, a stream going right by the garden here. And even during dry season, there's water running through it. Beginning of dry season, this is probably beginning of January. We built a, a simple sandbag dam. And this brought in a level of probably about five foot of water at the deepest. And we ran some PVC pipes under the dam with an inlet at the deepest part and that provides water pressure the three pipes are come together and that's what's running this ram pump that's a check valve that's that's operating right now and there's another check valve behind it so you click 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 and it runs like on a water hammer pressure operation. And inside the main cylinder, there's a bicycle inflated tire that provides extra, extra pressure. And a trickle of water is able to be pumped up this hose all the way up to that black tank. That's about a 15 foot rise from the bottom of the ram pump up to the tank. 
and it's been providing us water all through the dry season, more than what we need. This is a very simple operation. No gasoline, no electricity. It all runs on, uh, on water pressure. And this is about a 1,200 liter, 330 gallon water tank that is uh, suspended about four feet off the ground. And that provides pressure then that I'm able to put a garden hose to it and then water the garden. <clears throat> Future plans are to uh, put more of a, a drip irrigation system in, um, just to um, help save time. And we're also looking at alternative uh, energy, uh, sustainable energy, I guess you'd say. Uh, and this is uh, regarding biogas, generating biogas. Um, we have a system that is, has a digester set up and its main fuel is uh, cow manure and over a, a period of time the cow manure is broken down by the bacteria that uh, generate methane and this methane is then captured in uh, a large bladder it is then compressed and our desire is to be able to run either you know, generator systems, small engines, and uh, just have an alternate means of, uh, of an energy source uh, when needed. I purchased, uh, you know, a garden tiller, uh, and it's being renovated right now, but uh, my goal is to be able to run the garden tiller off, uh, off the biogas system. So it... Uh, you won't have to depend upon gasoline or, or any of the, those type of fuels to, to run the engine. As mentioned earlier, um, this is a, a biogas digester. This is a thousand liter or 250 gallon tote that has been converted into making biogas. Some plumbing was added. This is where uh, cow manure slurry is added in. There's a mixing mechanism here to help keep the, the, the interior content suspended and, and mixed properly. And on the back side, the methane gas comes out through here and goes through a scrubber system. The first scrubber takes out carbon dioxide and then the gas goes through um, some kitty litter, you know, take out any excess moisture and then it goes through a layer of uh, steel wool which takes out uh, hydrogen sulfide. Earlier this past week, it only took about uh, took about two days to fill up this 330 liter bladder. So that is full of uh, methane gas, and that'll be then compressed into a uh, into a tank. Any excess, you know, liquid that is. Uh, you know, once it's added into the biodigester, bio there's an excess flow. And this uh, liquid is high in nitrogen and other nutrients, and that's captured. And that is added then to the garden. It makes excellent fertilizer. Here are our compost piles. This pile here is, uh, is mainly rice hull and chicken manure which takes time to decompose. And this pile here is mainly leaves and twigs, typically just garden or yard waste. Over there is the raw material that still has yet to be ground up.
This unit here is a Troy built chipper and does very well at uh, you know grinding up wood, wood branches as well as the leaves. So this makes really good, you know, just from garden garden waste and yard waste makes good compost material that can be added to your garden could be added around trees with also the higher nitrogen you know, chicken manure we have chickens we have 10 chickens and um, on a regular basis I, I change out the bedding and save that and add this to the to the compost makes excellent fertilizer some advice I could give uh, people considering moving to Panama uh, it would be worthwhile to learn a little bit of Spanish um, before you arrive even some simple phrases and words hola como estas you know hello how are you um, that goes a long way in the Spanish or uh, Panamanian culture to be courteous to everyone. If uh, you're greeting them on the street or in the store, smiling, um, they, you, will, you will receive much more attention and help than if you do not greet. Also, don't pressure or demand, be demanding. That's a sure way of, uh, you know, if you need something, that's a sure way of being put to the bottom of the list or not getting what you need. You have to be you have to be courteous. And then try to integrate into the culture the best you can. Um, remember you're a visitor here initially and it's uh, it's best to do you know, best to approach Panamanians uh, in Spanish, at least in Volcan. And uh, that works. It works pretty good. Also have a plan. If you're going into a store, have a picture or uh, a, a Spanish phrase in mind. You know, there's wonderful translation apps out there now. You know, Google Translate you shouldn't have any trouble being able to communicate pictures or words um, but have a plan before you go somewhere and uh, you'll do fine some final comments uh, regarding Panama and Volcan in particular um, well Panama is a beautiful country you know, tropical but it is diverse you know you have the you have the ocean tropic areas it's more warm and but then the highland areas where Volcan's located, more temperate. Um, there are diverse microclimates, you know, depending on you know, the mountain valleys. They can be quite a bit different. And even, even 10 miles down the road, another you know, 500 feet or a thousand foot drop of elevation makes a huge difference in temperature. Um, there's something for everyone here whether it be ocean fishing, you know, tuna, mahi mahi are, are very popular. Hiking groups here in Volcan, horse riding. There's a community parades, horse parades. The low density population, you know, you don't feel so closed in. And that's that's been a great asset. For those who are, you know, considering mission work, there are mission opportunities and there are needs here in the country and in the area. Whether it's uh, teaching English to students, my wife and I do that a couple hours once a week at a school. Um, there's construction projects. There's humanitarian opportunities for my, you know all the migrants that are uh, passing through the country um, and there's also numerous 
short-term mission groups from the states that come in to Panama and, um, they need support translation support things like that so there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities if you uh, ask around and make yourself available there's opportunities uh, for missions like I said there's a lot of needs and it's uh, better to teach than to give you know it's it's better to teach someone how to fish than to always keep giving a fish and um, and then in the same time you're developing friendships and you're developing community and uh, so that's very important that's very important when you first come here um, you know get involved with community happenings community uh, projects uh, get to know people and it's who you know that can uh, also help you out too in time of need.